In macroeconomics, we study three primary variables, three phenomena that are going on in the economy that we really want to keep an eye on. The first thing we look at is people and whether or not they have a job. We keep a very close track of the unemployment rate measured monthly. We know it's not completely accurate, but it is a good indicator of trends, of what's happening over time. And so unemployment is one of the variables we're going to measure very regularly. The second thing we look at is our money, our dollars. How much does a dollar buy? Does a dollar, like the picture, begin to shrink in value? Does it lose value over time? Does a loaf of bread cost us two dollars instead of one dollar? So we measure inflation. We look at inflation on a regular basis in many different ways but we generally want to keep track of prices and see how prices are doing and whether they're rising so rapidly that people can't afford to keep up. The last thing we look at, now this is a picture of automobiles rolling off of a giant ship. Here's another picture, it's a huge warehouse of goods that are stored ready to go to the various stores through which they'll be, they'll be sold. So the third thing we're looking at is how much are we producing what is our gross domestic product or our output? So these are our three big measurements in macroeconomics, the unemployment rate, the inflation rate, and the GDP rate. Let's take a closer look at unemployment. As unemployment rises, what happens in our society and our economy? Look at this fella here. He looks a little bit unhappy, doesn't he? Well, the fact is he had a job for four years or five years or six years and then he's been unemployed for several years and he's thinking to, my, to himself, the last job interview I had was nine years ago and I've got to go out and look for a new job and I've been unemployed for four years or three years. We call that anxiety, don't we? We know there's more anxiety out there as people worry about finding employment. A second thing that happens, ooh, this lady looks a little frightened. What's she upset about? Well, her knowledge of software kind of stopped back in 2005. That's the last time she was employed using any kind of computer software. How valuable is a knowledge of Windows if you learn to use it in 2005? No wonder she looks that way. Also, when we look at people on assembly lines, skilled labor, doing very precise work. As a result of unemployment, they've lost their job skills if they haven't used them for the last several months or years. It's not just jobs. Look at this fellow and his sign. I lost my job and I've got two kids to feed. Again, it sort of raises the anxiety level. And then here's a fellow, Bob. What's going on with Bob? He doesn't look too happy. Well, he's been turned down for a job 12 times in the last 18 months. It's not because Bob's a bad worker. It's not even because Bob doesn't have any skills. It's because there are no jobs. Would that make you just a little bit depressed? Of course. These sorts of things take place in a recession. The deeper the recession, the more people that are unemployed, the longer the recession, the longer they go without jobs, we see other things. We see families begin to fall apart from the stress of no incomes. We see a rise in homelessness throughout the country. We see other folks who, desperate for a way to make a living to feed their families, they turn to crime. And finally, we see an increase in cries for help and things like suicide. This is what unemployment means. If it affects a lot of people, if it lasts for a long time, these things get worse. Our second criteria, or second measurement, was going to be inflation. Remember, we looked at what's happening to the dollar. Well, what if it takes more and more money to buy the things you're used to? What if the price of gasoline goes from $2 to $3 to $4 to $8? What does that do to your standard of living and mine and everyone else in the country? It means we see more and more people 
sliding towards poverty because typically their incomes don't go up as fast as inflation. So as we slide through more poverty, what else happens? We see people who own homes who can no longer make the payment. Many of their mortgages are adjusted so that over time those rates increase. And there's nothing like the foreclosure of your mortgage and the loss of your home to really, really depress you. Not just homes, by the way. If people can't make loan payments, what else do they lose? Well, sometimes this fella shows up and they have their automobiles repossessed. So these are the kinds of phenomena we see going on in a period of high inflation when people can't keep up with their costs. It's costing me more and more money to buy my groceries, feed my family, and suddenly I don't have the money to make my car payment or to make my house payment. Thank you, inflation. The other third criteria we were looking at, what happens when GDP or our level of output decreases? When businesses don't have enough customers and therefore don't have enough sales, and so they call their suppliers and say, don't produce as much. I don't need it. What happens when production falls? Well, again, more and more people find themselves in the unemployment line. We know what all that entailed. Another thing that happens is an economy slides into what we're going to call a recession. When the sales are down and people are losing jobs, there begins to be more and more talk of trade wars. We shouldn't let our jobs go overseas. We shouldn't be buying stuff from that country. We should be buying American products. And so we try to limit the import of goods from other countries. And they do the same thing to the things we produce and try to sell to them. That's a trade war. Trade wars don't help anybody. Another thing that can happen as a country becomes frightened and doesn't want to do business with its neighbors, it tends to become more isolationist. That means it has less to do internationally in terms of trade and in terms of influence and participation and having some say in what's going on around the world. The United States did this in the 1920s and very early you know, throughout the 30s, trying not to get involved in world events. That sort of isolationism is attributed by many to be one of the major causes of World War II. We tried to appease Hitler. We tried to not be involved. We tried to let Europe settle their own problems. But eventually it brought us in. Could we have done that a better way? If the economy is not producing very much, if we are in a recession, if GDP is falling, the future starts looking a little bit grim for everybody. Not just the folks looking for jobs today, but for their children. Technology slows down, research slows down, jobs disappear, businesses become very worried and pessimistic. All of this, this decline in GDP, is what we're going to call a recession when we see unemployment starting to climb. And if it gets bad enough or long enough, we're going to call it a depression. And to paraphrase Harry Truman, what's the difference in a recession and a depression? A recession is when your neighbor loses his job. Uh, it's kind of bad, but you know, it could be worse. A depression is when you go to work one day and you don't have a job. Maybe that's what it is. In any case, we're seeing skills lost, families broken up, mental problems, crime issues. It's not a good time. So all of these variables, inflation, unemployment, and GDP, are terribly important to us. And in our study of macroeconomics, they're sort of the pulse of the economy that we're going to continually monitor. The study of macroeconomics is much more relevant, much more interesting, and much more useful if you can understand it in an historical context. If you can see what happened in the past and the macroeconomic forces that were at work, it makes a whole lot more sense and it lets you look around and see what's going on today I think with a whole lot more understanding. 
the study of macroeconomics will give you the tools, the models, the vocabulary, and the understanding to help you make decisions and succeed in your life. I think that should be pretty important. It will also give you a perspective on what's going on in the world, what's going on in the, in the country, what's going on in this state, what's going on in this county. It will give you a perspective and an understanding to help you make intelligent decisions for you and your family and in the voting booth for your nation. It helps you understand what's going on so you don't get taken advantage of by ideologues, charlatans, con artists, people that want your vote and will tell you anything, any lie, to get your vote. Macroeconomics makes you a much more informed voter when you hear politicians talking about what's wrong with the country, what should be done, and what they think they would do. So I would suggest to you macroeconomics is a valuable set of tools and skills and vocabulary and understanding that can truly improve your life throughout your life. Thank you.